Okay, and without further ado, I would like to introduce our keynote. We are, are so blessed to have Kent Hutchinson from the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, he'll be speaking about how THC and CBD work in the brain, a little bit about his current research. Um, there's a lot of exciting things. Uh, Dr. Kent is um, a full professor at the University of Boulder. He runs a lab called the Change Lab. Uh, they have an MRI facility. I was able to go out there and see everything. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful place um, for people to learn about the brain. Uh, Dr. Kent also has an addiction background, which is really important. So when we're talking about cannabis research, um, there's a lot of haters out there, right? Oh, you know, the study is no good. It was run by people that love cannabis, right? Um, when you have somebody with an addiction background, which I'm partial to because that's also my background, um, you can really go look at the data and say, okay, well, these people understand how drugs impact the brain, right? We see how drugs like heroin um, can actually harm the brain. So when you, you study the brain for so many years and you know what bad drugs do to do the brain, you know, you can look at marijuana um, through that kind of filter and see, be able to see whether, you know, THC, whether CBD, what it does to the brain, you know, really have credible evidence that we can, you know, share with the rest of the world and show them, you know, what, what cannabis does or does not do. So without further ado, thank you so much for keynoting today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. I uh, appreciate the invitation and thanks to everybody for coming out today. And uh, yeah, so just a couple quick words about myself. Michelle talked a little bit about my background. I do sort of see myself as hopefully an honest broker when it comes to information and data about cannabis. And I do have you know one foot in the more traditional world of the NIH, and then I also sort of have one foot in the medical cannabis world in Boulder. So. It makes it interesting to straddle the fence sometimes, as you probably can imagine. But uh, one quick thing, also background wise. So, 25 years ago, I went into science. And I went into science for a reason. And the reason is because I wanted to do something that actually helped people. And then, 20 years of science, you know, after that point, I came to the realization that a lot of what I did, while it was pretty decent science, I wasn't seeing a lot of progress in to actually translate that science in a way that helps people. So when Colorado legalized, and I started looking more and just see kind of the background of this in my presentation, looking into the cannabis research more carefully, uh, it really sort of struck me that this is a field where there's definitely the potential to help people, more so than any other field of science. And that really got me excited. And you may wonder why. It's because for 40 years, the science, the research has been suppressed, right? You know, there's quite back in the 70s when people did the first study showing that CBD might actually do something for seizures, right? And then what happened after that? Well, nothing until about five years ago, right? So the point is, all the research has been suppressed for a long time. There's so much to do that can actually help people. So I'm excited about this uh, area of research. Um, and again, where things stand right now, we are sort of straddling the fence in terms of trying to figure out how we get funding from the National Institutes of Health, uh, and at the same time, how we do a very sort of honest uh, job with the research. Okay, so let me see if I can get this going here. Oh, actually, one, one quick thing to point out, which is basically a little bit different title than what was in the, the agenda. But I think this is kind of a fair characterization about uh, research after legalization of the phase of confusion. The only thing that's not fair about the statement is the question mark because uh, I put that up there to, you know, because I, I do talk to the NIH, the federal audience. And honestly, I think it could be more like an exclamation mark than a, than a question mark, right? You, you see, if you look at it, it's pretty basic and confused. Okay, so, um, so just to give you some, uh, some background here. So again, I'm a substance abuse person. Our first study was back in 2007. At that point in time, you know, sort of the, the medical effects weren't really on the radar for me. And so we wanted to look at the effects of marijuana on cognition and emotion. And so if you do that and you're a federally sponsored researcher, what you have to do is you have to apply for uh, uh, an FDA uh, IND, you have to get DA approval, and then you order your marijuana from, from NIDA, right, in, in Washington. And so we went through all of this. It took like a year to get all paperwork done. We had the DEA come out and inspect the facilities. We had like 
with three locked doors and a giant safe with marijuana cigarettes. And it was all intimidating and, and difficult. And then what happens is when you're done, basically, a FedEx box shows up with marijuana cigarettes, right? <laughs> kind of funny. And it looks like this. And basically, they're 2% THC, right? And so, um, so then we did the study, and we had people in 2007 had them smoke an, an entire marijuana cigarette. We did it in a pace procedure trying to standardize the dose. So they did like 12 puffs over about five minutes. So usually when I, when I talk about that with undergrads, this is the look I get from the undergrads, right? Because they're like, what, what the hell are you doing? You, you had to smoke a gram of marijuana, a gram of marijuana in five minutes, right? <laughs> like, oh, no, you're torturing these people, what are you doing? But then I tell them, no, no, that, you know, the marijuana cigarettes are from the government, and they're 2% THC, right? So it's about uh, one eighth the dose of what you might have expected back in, in 2007. Bottom line, we went to all this trouble, we did a study, and at the end of the day, you know, everybody came in, they hated the marijuana, it was disgusting, you know. And so the bottom line is it had no external validity. And what we mean by external validity is it doesn't generalize to the real world, right? So we did a study, whatever we learn is kind of useless because nobody smokes marijuana cigarettes in the government, basically, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so we said, never again are we going to do this. And then, and then, you know, five years later, six years later, it's 2013. And then, you know, you're reading about kids with doctor seizures moving to Colorado for marijuana, of course, you know, legalized marijuana. And, of course, there's all this stuff out there still about how, well, you know, marijuana destroys your brain and not to talk about IQ and, and, and whatnot, right? And so, um, it's a bit of a conundrum, right? So, what does this mean? And on the one hand, there's these, these old beliefs about how it's bad to Colorado, you know people that have benefited from campus, right? So, you know, how do we resolve this issue? And of course, the thing to me, when I thought, well, I need to go back and do some more research. Because obviously, what I thought I knew is, is, not, is not the way it is. So, so how do we reconcile those images? When, when you go back and look, of course, at the literature, you realize that it's a very complicated story. One thing you'll see in the next few slides is that the research methodology is complicated. And I think in many ways it sort of led us in the wrong direction in the past. But cannabis itself also is obviously complicated. You've got 80 plus cannabinoids, you know, THC and CBD is two of the primary cannabinoids can have different effects. Um, so the bottom line is different strains have different levels of cannabinoids and can have different effects. And then there are all these issues with the legal side of things that limit research. So what I'll talk about some today is some background on marijuana and alcohol and brain structure. And then I'll talk some about different strains and their effects on cognition and inflammation. And then what we know and don't know. I'm going to talk about what we're currently doing right now, trying to, to give us some more data on some of the benefits for side effects when it comes to when it comes to cannabis. Okay, so marijuana in the brain. Um, obviously, you know we've known for a long time that um, that marijuana can um, acutely have and has cognitive effects and disrupt cognitive processing on an acute level. And of course, th there's some caveats even with that. That's not necessarily true for everybody. And it's not true for all strains. And um, one thing that's been a, kind of a big deal in the literature for a long time now is whether heavy exposure to cannabis changes the brain and um, in adults, or whether it changes brain development in adolescence. So you probably hear a lot about this. And so I'll talk some more about that. When you look at studies that have been done in the past, if you look at them not so carefully, the impression you're going to get is that there are a number of studies that suggest that there is an association between marijuana use and reduced gray matter and white matter in the brain. So gray matter is the cell bodies and neurons, white matter are the sort of fiber bundles that connect different areas of the brain. So if you look at the background literature, you know, you'll see studies that suggest there's a negative effect of cannabis on brain structure. So important point is that none of those studies speak to cause and effect. That is, maybe there are differences in the brain that predate, you know, predate um, marijuana use or cannabis use. Oftentimes, we've done with small sample sizes. And almost universally, these studies uh, confound marijuana use and alcohol use. That is, the subjects in the study use both alcohol and marijuana. So it's very important to actually look at the effects of both of those. So we did a, one of our first uh, papers 
actually came out in the beginning of 2015, where we basically we just went back to our data. We have a lot of existing data where we scan the brain. So we bring people in to the M to our MR facility. We do an MR scan of the brain. We can look at gray matter, white matter in the brain. And most of this has been in the context of alcohol use, but obviously there are a lot of uh, cannabis users in there too, so we can go back and look at the effects of uh, cannabis. Um, and basically what we did here is we carefully matched people on alcohol use and other variables, so we could isolate the effects of cannabis. And uh, so the bottom line, um, when we look at those cannabis users and, and the way we isolate them, basically, again, um, no difference in alcohol use between marijuana users. So this is kind of a snapshot of what we found. I know it's a kind of a complicated slide. Let me break it down because it's really actually kind of simple when you think about it. This line here, any data point that's close to this line means there's no effect of marijuana, either positive or negative, on brain structure, right? And each one of these are individual studies. And so data points on this side mean that controls have greater gray matter than marijuana users, and data points on this side mean that marijuana users have greater a brain matter density that controls. And all you have to do is look at the big picture, right? The big picture is the thoughts are all over the map, right? So when you average over all the studies, this is what you find here. And remember, anything close to the line means there's no effect of marijuana on the brain, right, in terms of brain structure. So the bottom line is, there's, there's a bunch of crap, right, in these studies, <laughs> right? And, and not much going on, right? But again, what happens is people start cherry pick those studies to support the case that Cannabis, you know, hurts the, basically hurts the brain. Okay, so we did some new analyses. And these are in very large sample sizes: 1,300 adults with 800, uh, sorry, more than 800 adults, more than 400 adolescents. And again, we went back just to look at the association between frequency of marijuana use while controlling for alcohol use and um, different part in the structure and different parts of the brain. And so, um, again, we were controlling here for age, sex, and her, um, but we looked at the effect of alcohol controlling age, sex, and marijuana use. Then we looked at the effect of marijuana controlling for age, sex, and alcohol use. Because remember, it's important to tease apart the alcohol from the marijuana. So I'm going to show you a series of um, snapshots of the, of the brain up here. And anywhere you see color means there's an association between gray matter density in that part of the brain and in this case, alcohol effects, right? So you can see in the, in the adult sample, if you use a lot of alcohol over a lot of years, you're gonna see changes in gray matter pretty pervasively across the brain. When you look at the effects of marijuana, though, controlling for alcohol, we don't see any significant effects of marijuana um, on gray matter in the brain. <clears throat> so um, looking at white matter tracks in the brain, same story, if you're looking at alcohol controlling for marijuana, you see pretty pervasive effects of alcohol on white matter in the brain. But if you look at marijuana controlling for alcohol, you don't see any significant effects. So we look at um, adolescents, uh, and what we see here, actually in our most recent analysis, we, we see some small alcohol effects in adolescents, but no marijuana effects. And then looking at white matter, some small alcohol effects in adolescents, no marijuana effects. So the bottom line is that uh, alcohol is pretty clearly associated with widespread reductions in gray matter density and, and white matter integrity in the brain. But um, when you look at marijuana, there's no evidence, right, consistent with our first paper, that there's any association between changes in gray matter and white matter in frequency of cannabis use. Okay, so, um, so how then does it get dazed and confused? Well, this is a good example. Right? I gave this talk actually in Washington back in March. Right before I gave the talk, this paper came out in a pretty prestigious journal. And, you know, these are um, also pretty, you know, decent, they're, they're good scientists and, and nice people. But it's just fascinating to look at the <laughs> conclusion that they reviewed, right? So the conclusion, they basically conclude that marijuana is associated with deficits in brain structures. And, you know, they, they, there's basically about 30 studies that they reviewed in this paper. And so they basically broke it down by brain region, right? So this is a snapshot of you know, one part of the paper. This is looking at a part of the brain called the cerebellum, right? So there have been 30 studies looking at cannabis in the brain, but only three reported anything about the cerebellum, even though all 30 have cerebellum data, right? And so you, know, you don't have to be a mathematician to, to add these three numbers up, right? But basically one study found that marijuana was associated with a 7% reduction, or 7% 
uh, increase, one at 27% reduction, and one at 20% increase, right? So when you add those three numbers up, you get zero, right? Zero. <laughs> so, so the conclusion of the review is there's an effect of marijuana in the brain. When you look at the numbers, there's not really an effect of marijuana in the brain, right? That's not to say there won't be at some point in time you find some isolated part of the brain that's influenced, but you, you have to be careful when you look at these studies. And a lot of times people on the press are not that careful, right? So that, that's kind of problematic. Okay, so other ways, so basically there are a whole set of methodological issues that, that sort of lends, uh, that lend themselves to causing there to be days confused. Um, again, the compound of alcohol and, and tobacco use, measurement errors, small sample sizes. But one thing that nobody's looked at also is that this you know, idea that different ratios of cannabinoid can also have an impact in terms of the, the factors of, of the cannabis. So we thought it would be really nice to start moving in that direction. Let's start looking at the effects of different ratios of cannabinoids and different strains. And so the way I kind of explain this to people and I think about the, you know, just the effect of strain matter, if you ask some people, of course, they'll tell you that, that some strains make you hungry, right? Some strains make you sleepy. Some strains make you so paranoid just you can't go to sleep. Right? And some, some strains make you happy, right? So most people, the conventional wisdom out there is that different strains have different effects, right? If it's true for being hungry and sleepy and anxious and happy, it's probably true for other things too. So um, we started this study uh, a year and a half ago. And we're in the process of writing it to make a publication. But we wanted to know if different strains, which are different levels, in this case of, of harm, but you'll see we look more broadly than just harm. And it, you know, just to give you some background here in terms of how this went down, Legally, this has been a, we'll talk about this more in a minute, but it's been a big problem getting the university to sign off on any kind of marijuana research, right? Um, and so we, it took us a long time to basically come to a point where we could basically have people, like we could, so the bottom line is we can't, as university researchers, we can't touch it. Um, we can't be in the same room with it. It's like these bizarre state regulations about how you, how you can interact with cannabis, right? And so, um, but we can have people go to a dispensary and buy a certain kind of Right. So um, what we did is we recruited regular cannabis users, 22 of them, who use a typical THC strain to basically switch to a high CBD, low THC strain for three days, and then we collected their blood to verify they actually switched. Right. So we can look at the ratio of THC and CBD in the blood. That tells us they're actually smoking the CBD strain. So half of them got the, the high CBD, low THC strain for three days. Half of them kept smoking a high THC, no CBD strain. And so right at the last time they smoked, in three days, we went and picked them up and brought them back to the lab. Right? So we can't have cannabis in the lab, we can transport the cannabis user to the lab. And we can't have them smoke certain strains as long as we don't touch the marijuana. That's, that's the way it works. So, um, so bottom line is, then we, then we brought them in and we could, you know, we can look at the blood, at the ratio of CBD to THC. We can also look at effects on cognition and, and inflammation by biomarkers in the blood. And so this was all proof of concept study to show people that you know that this could be done. So um, this is just a quick slide looking at verbal recall. And so the, some of the graphics that you can here, but basically the, the white um, dots here are um, THC levels and people that got the combination CBD THC. And the red squares are people who got just the high THC. And again, even though the graph is a little wonky here, what you can see is there is a significant relationship between THC blood levels, which is this down here, and errors in terms of verbal recall. So it makes sense, right? The more THC in your blood, the more likely you are acutely, at least, to, to uh, have some trouble with verbal recall. But when CBD accompanied that THC, there was no relationship between um, THC levels and CBD. So again, some evidence that the effects of marijuana depend on what's in the marijuana. So for me, the cool thing here is looking at inflammation. Because when you talk about the positive effects of cannabis and inflammation, or positive effects of cannabis in terms of different um, disorders and disease states, uh, probably a big part of that positive effect is related to anti-inflammatory effects, right? So what we can do is we can look at inflammation biomarkers in the blood, and we can do that for the people who receive the THC strain, but also do it for the people who receive the combination of THC CBD strain. And so you can see here the two groups, there's no differences in terms of these biomarkers related inflammation. There's no difference at baseline before they switch strains. 
But after they switch strains, what you see is you see the CBD strain showing less you know, inflammatory biomarkers than the THC strain. Again, suggesting that, at least in terms of inflammation, there may be a difference based on strain and based on CBD level. Okay, so um, bottom line, you know, a, I told you before, at least I alluded to it, that small sample sizes can be misleading. Be careful. This is a small sample size here. Um, but, you know, again, we're, we're, this is about proof of concept. It's about finding ways around the legal obstacles, right? How can we do this research? And so, um, but this study does suggest that um, you do see the typical sort of effect of THC and verbal recall, but only in the absence of CBD. And we do see some differences in terms of cytokines those inflammatory biomarkers with lower levels in the CBD strain. So um, it's really hard to say at this point, you know, what's going on here in terms of the relationship between THC and CBD inflammation, but clearly there's something going on that we should be looking at in the future. Okay, so um, I think I'm going to sort of skip over this part. But the bottom line is there's a lot we still need to know. A lot of it, I think, has to do with what exactly is in the cannabis and, um, and what effect does that have in terms of different um, measures related to you know, the benefits or potential harms of cannabis. Okay, so um, let's just talk about where we're at in terms of how we get this research done. And this is kind of where we start, right? I mean, you know, after we legalized in Colorado, we figure out how to work with the university administration on, on cannabis research. And this, this is what it feels like. You're looking at a wall, right? You try to get over the wall, you try to dig under the wall, you think maybe you got the long enough wall, and that's not a good idea, right? <laughs> But um, it's not easy to figure out. And so this is the, I tell people in Washington, you know, this is the world I live in, where, you know, we have roughly 600,000, more than that, plants cultivated, um, 25,000 25, pounds of flour, 650,000 edible units sold per month, per month, right? People in Washington don't understand this. They, they don't, you know, our sp the sponsors, they have no idea how far, how advanced we are in Colorado. They just don't have a clue. So, you know, dispensaries out there for Starbucks.